joining us this afternoon. I'm Lucy Kassir, and I'm the Director of Education and Engagement at the Columbus Museum. We're so happy that we can be together virtually for this artist talk since we can't be physically together at the museum right now. Joining us today are Jonathan Frederick Walls and Nancy Friedman Sanchez. An expert on American modernism, Jonathan Frederick Walls is the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Curator of American Art at the Columbus Museum in Columbus, Georgia. In his previous job, he served as a curator of American art at the Sheldon Museum of Art in Lincoln, Nebraska, and this is where he first encountered Nancy and her work. With Seth Feeman at the, at the Chrysler Museum of Art, he is currently co-curating co the exhibition, Alma W. Thomas, Everything is Beautiful, scheduled to open at the Chrysler in the summer of 2021 before closing at the Columbus Museum the following year. We are also joined by Nancy Friedman Sanchez, a mixed media artist originally from Bogota, Colombia. The large scale drawings that she has recently been creating allude to the late 20th century art movements of minimalism and pattern and design. They also explore the more contemporary concerns of identity, me memory, gender, and globalism. Nancy holds a master's degree from New York University and a BFA from Otis Art Institute. She also studied in Bogota, Colombia. She currently splits her time between studios in New York City and Lincoln, Nebraska. Nancy has exhibited internationally and her work can be found in such prestigious collections as El Museo del Barrio, the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I hope I don't butcher this, <laughs> El Museo de Arte Contemporáneo in Bogota, Colombia, among other institutions. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She has received many awards, including a Smithsonian Artist Fellowship and a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. Nancy won the biennial Catherine Doctorow Prize for Contemporary Painting in early 2019, awarded by the Doctorow Family Foundation and the Utah Museum of Contemporary Art. The Columbus Museum are grateful to Jared Stephenson, curator of exhibitions at Utah MOCA, for organizing Nancy's project Costa Paintings that has traveled to the Columbus Museum as the second stop for the exhibition. So if we could have the photos of the installation at the Columbus Museum, that would be great. While we're waiting, I'll just jump in and say thank you again to Jared at Utah MOCA um, for organizing the project um, and to Bridget Russell, who is Director of Marketing and Public Relations at the Columbus Museum, who's behind the scenes and helping us with images and all the tech stuff. So thank you, Bridget. We really appreciate everything you do. Yes. And um, what you see, oh. Go ahead, go ahead. What you see currently on your screen are installation images of the installation of Costa paintings at the Columbus Museum. It was installed this spring and was scheduled to open on March 21st, 2020. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that didn't quite go as planned. So the exhibition is on site and we're looking forward to welcoming everybody here to it just as soon as we're able to reopen safely to the public. So just a couple of housekeeping things before I turn it back over to Jonathan. Following today's conversation between Jonathan and Nancy, we will have a question and answer session. To participate on a computer, at the bottom of your screen, you can click on the Q&A button and you'll be able to type in your question to share with everyone. If you are on a phone, you'll dial star nine and you'll be able to ask your question verbally. So without <laughs> any, anything else from me, I'll turn it over to Jonathan and I'll see you for the Q&A. Thanks, Lucy. Um, speaking of Jared um, and 2017, um, uh that was the year that year like this show happened um with a sort of interesting series of events kind of coming to a confluence and so um the doctor o prize when it was given in 2017 um this is the prize that the utah museum of contemporary art gives every other year to um, an artist um, and it's specifically about contemporary painting and um, by coincidence, um, the winner in 2017 was Anna Betbees, who is actually from Columbus, Georgia. And Jared was really great um, in letting us be the second venue for the project that he put together for Anna so that we could give her 
a show in her hometown. Um, so of course, I was keeping my eyes out on what, Ken, uh, what um, Utah Mocha was up to. In the meantime, in 2017, Nancy had a show at the Kentler International Drawing Center, which is in Brooklyn. And also coincidentally, the Kentler is run by Florence Neal, and she is also from Columbus, Georgia. So obviously, Nancy, you have to come through Columbus at some point <laughs> because yeah. everybody seems to be either from here or comes through here. Um, and so Nancy and I, I just happened to be in New York um, for a different reason, but I saw that Nancy was having an opening. Um, and Nancy and I, as Lucy uh, alluded, we first became, um, aware of each other when I was based in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I should also say, uh, Nancy and her partner, Charlie Friedman, run an alternative space in Lincoln called Fiendishplatz. So I wanna give a shout out to Fiendishplatz where they mount really cutting edge and really super interesting projects um, for the Lincoln arts community. Um, it's a really great resource if you're in Nebraska. So 2017, Anna Betby's and Nancy's show at the Kentler, and then flash forward two more years, and very happily, the Dr. O Prize goes to Nancy. So I was so excited when I heard the news from Jared, and I immediately um, wrote and asked if we could also host Nancy's show as the second venue. And Jared and his team were very willing to let that happen. So we have the show on view. Right now, um, of course, you all can't take advantage of it just quite yet, but we will announce um, new dates once the museum is reopened to the public. So stay tuned for that. Um, we wanted to use this as an opportunity as kind of a teaser to get people uh, familiar with the work ahead of time so that when you come see the project at the museum, you'll have heard from the artist herself. So without further ado, Nancy, I'll start. Um, the first question is um, probably expected. I um, just wanted to ask you to explain to our listeners um, about sort of how this project came about. Um, it's called Casta Paintings and um, how, like what inspired you and also um, kind of how it fits into your sort of career. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I am super honored and very excited and a little bit nervous. <laughs> and where do I start? I, um, well, I'm going to start a little bit before Casta Paintings. And uh, I used to live in New York with my husband and child, and I lived there for 20 years. And prior to that, I lived in Bogota, Colombia, where I was born and raised. And um, in 2011, uh, my family and I moved to, moved to Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, and we moved in part because we needed to uh, make more work and because New York seemed unsustainable. But what happened here was very surprising to me. I had a great deal of time. And as any big change it, that happens in a life, it, it's, it, it's kind of like a crisis. So I had a good year to kind of roam around Lincoln, read a great deal, uh, just investigate the city, consider the idea that my career was over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and then, and, 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 and what happened was that I started working and, and in that crisis, I thought, okay, so if I was a writer, because I like to read, although I'm not a writer, I thought, well, what, what is it, where, where would I be in this, in this place in time? And I thought, well, possibly I would have written a few essays or stories or poems and so where am I going and I thought well 
it's time to jump into a novel, a complex narrative with many characters. And at the time I was reading a um, novel by Roberto Bolaños, and, which is told in, in like 40 characters. And that's the origin. So Casta Paintings is one of the voices, one of the stories. And so is Cornucopia, and so is Travelers and Settlers, and they each work. So Castas is a, is a chapter. But Castas has an origin that is very close to my, uh, to my origins as a person that grew up in, mm. in Colombia, as a descendant of, mm. of the conquest and the colony by the Spanish in, 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 in South America, in Colombia, per se. Yes. Can you talk about, um, <clears throat> just briefly, what, so like how many chapters do you envision the novel to have? I am not sure. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, but what it, what it has allowed me to do is to investigate topics that I'm interested in. Mm. Either because aesthetically, I, they, it's kind of like, it has like various prongs, either aesthetically I find them very inviting, mm -hmm. but historically they're connected to uh, something very close to, you know, to, to my upbringing. So like Gasta Paintings is related to the terrible class differences that exist in Colombia and, yeah. that I, and that I grew up witnessing, participating in, being oppressed by, being oppressor, uh, being a full part of that weave. And in, in moving to the US close to 27 years ago, basically what I saw again was that, that mm -hmm. difference in class, but named, named <clears throat> in, with different words. It had a yep. different title. So that this might be a good point for um, because I think in your studio you have some of the other chapters. Yeah. Um, so maybe you, we could just sort yeah. of see some so of those. I'm using my table a little bit as a tripod so you can see. So behind here there is a, I'm going to move so you can see it. There is a large cornucopia. I call it cornucopia. And then moving along. Uh, smaller. In the back, they're just these uh, uh, woodblock prints that I did for uh, Instituto Caru y Cuervo in Colombia. This is for uh, a book uh, written uh, by a very esteemed Afro-Colombian writer. Uh, the piece in the back is called uh, Leaning Chumbes and inspired in, in minimal sculptures, but using the pattern of indigenous textiles. The piece on the table is called Travelers and Settlers, and it's a narrative sculpture talking about ideas of migration, history. It uses found objects, carved wood, and even a small pre-Columbian figure. And over here, you can see one of the Casta paintings. That's great. Thank you so much for showing us. Um, I know. Turn this around again. <laughs> our um, our practice, practice video, you also showed us um, your work table, which has a lot of the collage elements. Oh, yes. Let me just. This is. I'd love to see that. It has no tripod. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, that would be a good segue to explain how you yeah. use those. Yes. So. I started working with collage thinking of the barniz de pasto or mopa mopa, which is a tradition that has existed in, um, in Colombia, in the north of Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia, all the way back to the Incas. And during the 17th century, when the Spanish were, were conquering, they, and they were at the same time doing uh, commerce. They were 
taking the filling up the galleons with gold and silver and taking it taking them to europe and it to bring back porcelain silk uh chinese lacquer which was very prized in the courts of europe yep. they encountered this uh technique called mopa mopa which they named barniz de pasto and it's basically a collage the collage made with a natural resin that was used in in um uh, before before the conquest on wood objects on wood bowls called queros and so and that the amazing thing is that that tradition has persisted and exists still today and you see it now in objects that are made for more for a a tourist uh, uh, consumption. So it has followed in some way the, the, the comings and goings of history, of commerce, of capitalism. Yeah. And so that's, that's how I came to this idea of, of making collage. But also there's somebody else, sorry, it's too, it's too no, long. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> so there's also, I was doing a fellowship at the Smithsonian and I was, researching all of these botanical illustrations that were done during the colony. Mm -hmm. And I found the work of this, uh, aside, those, aside those illustrations, which were done to record what the Europeans were finding and were claiming as their holdings. Right. But along with that, I found the work of an English woman uh, because all my work is, for me, it's also it's through the filter of feminism. So I found the work of this uh, uh, English woman who ascended to the court, to being to, in the courts of, of England as an artist. And her work was following the, the drawings that, were, that naturalists were doing. And so she was painting pieces of paper and cutting them and making small collages. So it, so it's, I was looking at these two things, mm -hmm. in particular, the Mopa Mopa, the Barniz de Pasto. There's so many things, <laughs> so your work is so rich, um, so many things to focus on. Um, one thing I was curious about that our viewers may also be curious about when they actually see the work is the materials you use are a little bit unusual, you know, not your sort of expected sort of arches, watercolor paper or watercolor. So if you maybe could show us some of the, um, the support and the, the, the colors that you use might be interesting. Yeah, so I work, whoops, I work with Tyvek. Tyvek is a material that is used for shipping and since I have shipped myself so many times, many times migrating back and forth between the US and Colombia, I, and, and, and also to be able to make large scale work and to be able to ship it, I looked for a paper that would be, that would be acid free, that would be inert, that would function, that would be archival, that would not get torn in packing and shipping. And this is how I came, this is how I came to, to Tyvek. But also thinking of, of a contemporary material, of how, yeah. you use, how do you use the materials of your time? Just as Mopa Mopa was something that was taken by the Spanish to imitate something Chinese, mm -hmm. how do you take a contemporary material to speak of a transcultural process from the past. Yeah. So that's that's how I came to oh, it. Gosh, you're, I'm getting a little misty because your material really does sort of um, reinforce your, your thinking through of ideas about how ideas move, how visual motifs move, how objects move, and how bodies move like through geopolitical um, sort of distinctions, but also um, just geography and that kind of thing. And, and, and it's very much part of you too, as someone who travels back and forth to South America. 
Yeah. Um, I wanted to say something about feminism because that's something that really um, is close to my heart as well. And um, Lucy, of course, alluded to minimalism and pattern and decoration, but your work also um, relates to sort of what might, we might call classic feminist art from the 1970s with um, materials that are sort of maybe more domestic. Um, so the Mopa Mopa idea, um, also sort of like how flowers and femininity are, are sort of elided um, together. Um, and also these kind of um, almost taking sort of the everyday and um, domestic uh, kinds of craft and making them like on this monumental scale, right? And so that's something that really drew me. I, I, I'm, I have to admit, I'm a special fan of the cornucopias. I just find them so rich and so beautiful and so intriguing because there's so many kind of things to look at. Um, and that was something that really drew me um, in your show at the Kentler. Like I just immediately <laughs> fell in love with the cornucopia that you had there. And if you remember, I was thinking, oh my gosh, like I love this so much, I need to, to take it to um, Columbus. Um, and if folks at home know the museum space before we commissioned Jarrett Key to make a, a mural um, for us. Um, I was thinking of this cornucopia piece as something that could um, be displayed in the, the space that we have um, Jarrett's piece in now. Um, could you maybe, like, because you have a cornucopia behind you, could you maybe point out some of the small things that might not be noticed right away? Um, mm -hmm. Viewers? Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll move so you can see it. So yeah. you can see it. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm just showing something else in the process. <laughs> 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 so, so this piece is, uh, 80 by 160 inches wide. And I, I guess in terms of theme, I'm very interested in ideas of the domestic because it's all, it's again, it's about, it's about the caste. It's about where the, the hierarchy and where these, uh, where these images stand in relationship to hierarchy. So the handmade, I would say, on our world today, in some level, uh, is kind of at the, in the lower part of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in that. Same with the still life. You know, historically, mm -hmm. the, the landscape are, are, have been more uh, prized, more mm -hmm. appreciated. So, so I think those, those elements, and then of course, nature. Nature has been at the bottom of our, of our totem pole. We're, we're destroying our planet. So I think I'm, I'm interested in referencing that. And a cornucopia is, a, is, is an abundance. It's, it's this idea that it's, it, that it's eternal. But some of the figures here have, uh, I have these, uh, these shooters you know, shooting, shooting at flowers, the absurdity of that, you know, the absurdity of, of uh, shooting at nature. And all of the imagery is researched. So I have looked at every flower that appears in a cornucopia. I have investigated it in a, in a decorative object from mm -hmm. the colony. And, that, and so, but those, those images from the colony came, they were, they were hybrids. They were, they were the images that were coming from Asia with the images that were coming from Europe and which were commissioned to local indigenous or, or Creole artisan to make. And the result of course is, is a completely hybrid iconography yeah so 
I think my job in this is to continue that hybridity. Mm -hmm. What happens in history as you as you keep um, as you keep revising history and 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 making into the future. It also makes me think. Speaking of sort of flowers and travel across borders, how in our current sort of capitalist economy, you know, we don't in North America really think much of going to the grocery store and buying flowers out of season, but really those flowers are being grown in the Southern Hemisphere and then brought across all of these borders and, um, you know, sold in the United States. So there's another layer yet embedded in sort of um, your imagery, I think. Um, so we do have a cornucopia at the museum, but um, most of the work is from the Casta painting series. So maybe Bridget, you could- um, So I'll come back in, yes? Yes. Bridget could show some of the images and Nancy, maybe if one of them in particular strikes you, you could make some commentary. We caught Bridget off guard. <laughs> oh, while we're waiting, there we go. So these figures um, include these sort of bodies with multiple limbs and um, you also incorporate in three dimensions um, these masks that you find and buy and these Spanish combs. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, ca the Casta paintings is our genre of painting that started during the the during the colony yeah. and it came out of the curiosity of the of the spanish of trying to understand what was happening in this in this uh racial uh mixing that was happening because the the way the conquest happened in in central and south america was that galleons arrived with men. It was not like the like North America where entire families were fleeing religious persecution or or famine or it was it, it was men who were arriving and who by rape or marriage started immediately intermixing with the population and then the bringing of uh, African people and turning them into slaves and also mixing with, so the mixture of all of these different, of all of these different people. And so that, uh, that mixture is, that's Latin America. I mean, it's a, it's a Latin America is mestizo, is miscegenated completely. It's a, and, and, and Casta paintings are about that. I followed, I followed the, the, I first did a couple kind of freely. I, I had a, a mask at home with a Spanish comb that, with two Spanish combs that had belonged, I don't know if you can see there, the Spanish comb behind the mask, that had belonged to my mom and that possibly she wore at balls when oh, she wow. was young. Yeah in the way that people do here when they want to like they do oktoberfest or or st patrick's day like to a uh, it's cultural memory to say mm -hmm. i you know i come from i come from spain or i but it's also an assertion of 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 racial uh purity yeah and I was just very interested in that from a from a personal. I mean, all of this, all of this is Latin America, but it's very close to my heart. Yeah. 
And so I started playing with the mask and the comb and then, and then started, I, some point, I don't know how the body came in. And at first the arms were not raised. They were, they, they were just down, but I realized, no, this needs to have more of a, of a different, of a different kind of position. And then when I raised the arms, it was like, ha, huh, it looks like when you are, when you are threatened, when you are going through a TSA machine. Uh, yeah. Also, it's uh, all the various arms and the, it's also you make yourself bigger. Yeah. It's all about, it's about that ambiguity and that, you know, it's the oppression, the oppressed. What I did not want was for them to be sexualized. Mm -hmm. Rectified. So I made the figures more like maps, mm -hmm. but yeah, maps that speak more of land, of water. I love how, um, of course, folks at home can't see very close up in person, but the just the way that you've layered the different colors of ink, I find really seductive, and um, the the back the black background is just so dark. Um, it really provides this great visual foil that these figures appear against. Um, and just to mention too, I didn't say this earlier, but these are, those flowers that you were showing us are these um, elements here as well. Um, those are also uh, sort of three-dimensional uh, pieces that you're incorporating onto the sort of flat surface of the Tyvek. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about maybe where the masks and the combs come from past that sort of initial pair that were very personal to you? So I realized like, okay, if I'm going to do the 16 castas and I follow the historical formula, well, where am I going to find them? So I went to eBay. So I, oh. <laughs> I used the contemporary form of transaction uh, but what I found was in some cases kind of heartbreaking because they're pieces that you know belong in museums they're they're mm -hmm. masks that are, that are I can't believe that this is in like somebody's shed or right. Right. yeah so it was a bringing it out from from the rabbit hole of eBay and, and giving them a place of honor again. Can you talk about maybe um, what kind of function do these masks have in their sort of quote unquote natural context? I think they are all for some kind of ritual. Uh -huh. the, the couple that I used from the Amazon, they are, and they are, most likely the ones that belong in in museums they mm -hmm. uh, are used in rituals rituals of fertility uh yes and others i think are carnival i think like the one that is here now is is from some kind of carnival mm -hmm. but um i made sure that they all came from different places oh yeah so some are caribbean Colombia, Brazil, Mexico. Yeah, that really augments your idea of mixing and, and how things flow, um, ideas and visual motifs. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued by the combs too, like those were just on eBay or did you go to a special place? No, eBay, yeah, I no. just, yeah. Um, and what folks who aren't seeing the captions for these um, and that I was reminded of is that all of the figures are feminine because they, ha they end in A. Uh, yeah. And so that relates to your idea of not wanting to objectify the body, but, it, but it's incredibly important to you that they're all female figures. 
I wanted them all to be female. So I invited different um, Latina women to the studio at, to, to trace them. And I, I, for, I started with me and then mm -hmm. traced my daughter and then close friends and then gradually just started started kind of branching out from there then people would you know some women would trace other other women and it, it was just all very just very uh organic and how it grew yeah so maybe now's time um, we'd love to hear from the audience um, comments or questions for Nancy or me or Nancy, you could ask me a question. Um, we'd love to have some interaction with the folks at, at home. And maybe um, Lucy, you can jump in and be our moderator. All right. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Possible to see everybody else? Yes. All right. So if you have some questions, you can leave them in the chat. It looks like our first question from Ann Stagg is, can you talk about your color palette? Well, uh, yes. The, the background? which uh, in most cases is black, is inspired in the religious paintings of uh, the colony. And that drama that occurs in those paintings, and often many of those works are religious and they function as uh, kind of teachings. They would hang in churches or, or they had a, they had a kind of pedagogical uh, objective. So the background comes from that, but also I was very inspired by the minimalist drawings of Richard Serra. Mm -hmm. So I think of those, but I think of those, that, that, that color and that background as those kind of sort of authoritative, uh, figure no one is a, a person is, a, is an artist which is also synonymous of something that is north american of a time of, of empire relationship to a different empire which is the spanish empire mm -hmm. uh, but masculine patriarchal it's a dominant ideological umbrella so that that so my background is thought of in that i i chose that very kind of I, I knew exactly why. Mm -hmm. the color palette, I, I want it close to the color palette of, of, uh, of the indigenous works and also of that Spanish colonial painting. Yeah. Maybe while Lucy is looking for the next question, um, I know we have some students um, who are attending virtually with Professor Hannah Israel, who's teaching a experimental drawing class at Columbus State University, which is here in Columbus. We often do collaborations together. Um, maybe you could talk about if you, um, having gone through art school yourself and now like, sort of mid-career, looking back at your art school self, maybe something you would tell that person for, for the students that are, that are listening. Well, I would say, I would say it has to be very personal. It has to, the work you make has to be really something that, you know, that, Gives you some pains. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot. <laughs> and I would say the other thing is like never stop studying. Yeah. That's great advice. Lucy, got some more for us? Okay, I muted myself. 
Um, so we have a question asking about um, if you could see the work becoming more three-dimensional and if so, how or if not, why? Hmm. Yes, I see the work becoming three-dimensional and I, I venture into sculpture here and there. My mainstay is two-dimensional. But when, it, when things start getting a little bit, when I start just kind of, you know, like it staying in place, like the wheel is not going anywhere, oh. I, I try to go into a completely different direction. And often it is sculpture. Hmm. Yeah. But I would not consider myself a sculptor. Mm -hmm. By any means. <laughs> You muted, you muted yourself again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm trying to keep my toddler from screaming into the microphone. <laughs> Margo. <laughs> we love you, Margo. <laughs> um, so I, we have a question here in the Q&A that also came up in the chat about how long the exhibition will be on view at the museum. So once we know when we're able to reopen, we'll announce a new closing date for the exhibition. We're hoping to get a similar length of run time as we had originally planned. So it should be Definitely. extended past the closing date. We're still working on all of that. Um, so let's see, we have a question here in the Q&A saying that the cut paper of the collages reminds them of, and I apologize for my pronunciation, <laughs> the Ajakti figures of the Nahua people in Mesoamerica. Um, this was something that was used by shamans to drive away evil spirits that could harm the village. And Danielle's asking if this was part of your inspiration, Nancy. Well, I look at indigenous art all the time. So uh, I look at the Tikuna drawings, some of the the the, the bark pieces from the Amazon. And I mean, definitely. I mean, have I looked at, the, at, at those particular works to study those works? No. I have looked, um, like when I was at, uh, at uh, uh, doing this fellowship at the Smithsonian, I visited the, the American Indian Museum there. And one of the things that, that I was just absolutely marveled was that there is such a huge, um, there's so many common denominators between yeah. the Inuit all the way up in, in North America to, to Patagonia. Yeah. Suspended figures, uh, kind of like a, a picture plane with suspended figures that go around. A, the geometries are, are very connected all along. So that interests me very much. So we have another question asking about the number of Costa paintings in the exhibition that we have 16 and asking if this is significant. Well, the I'll jump in as curator and just say, um, uh, Nancy intends to make 16, and I'm embarrassed to admit, I can't remember if we're showing 14 or 15, but part of that was um, just about the space that we had available. Um, but I think Nancy, and you can speak to this, still intends to make one more to, to the, the, the genre she's talking about um, is a predetermined form of 16 different um, categories. And so Nancy intends to make one for each of the categories. So, yes, yeah, you just, you just said it, Jonathan, yeah. Yeah, so, but I consider that chapter, that's one piece, basically, yeah. But I do show them sometimes separately. So Cameron, who is our um, amazing designer of exhibitions, she just jumped in and said, we have 15. So you just have to make one more. <laughs> it's right. Oh, that's right. 
right there. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's here because it was going to the Museo Latino for a show. Yeah. Oh, good. Great. More traveling across borders. <laughs> so we have another question from Charlie Friedman asking how these images relate to carnival images, carnival images from Barranquilla. Hmm. Well, well, the carnival from Barranquilla, which is similar to Mardi Gras and the carnival in Rio, is a I mean, it's a carnival that has, it's a festivity that has, it's also transcultural. It has elements from the rituals that came from Africa, from Europe and indigenous. So uh, the masks have an inherent connection, but I don't think of it as, as that like, like they're connected to the carnival in Barranquilla, no. Connected because historically it's their hybrid, but. All right, we have another question asking about what the woodblock works are, are, what are the woodblock works for? Are they used in the collages and do you use any other traditional print methods? Well, this is a project that I just finished and it's going, so it's a collaboration with Puto Caro y Cuervo in Colombia with the text of Manuel Zapata Olivella, who uh, is a, a, a well-known Afro-Colombian writer uh, who writes uh, novels and stories of the Afro-Colombian experience. So that is going to go in, it, it, it's already, I mean, it just got published. It's going to all the public libraries in Colombia. And I wanted that project to be done in Woodblock because Woodblock is a kind of, I, the way I see it, it's very brusque. There is, you're, 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 you're attacking a piece of wood. It, it has an inherent, violence and the story behind is a is a story of violence and of human drama on you know on on a river so so that's why i use the the wood block so i but it was just specific for that and it, i there was a whole learning curve and i worked with a great studio here in Lincoln called Constellation Studios. Oh yeah, our friend Karen who runs that and um, Karen was very kind and donated three pieces to our museum collection a couple of years ago. So we're familiar with her and her work. She does a great job at Constellation. Yeah, no, that was, that was fantastic, yes. And um, so another question that we have is, how did traveling with your mother influence your work? My mother was an anthropologist and I spent my childhood going with her to, to well, the places where she was doing her work. One of them was Palenque de San Basilio, which was a maroon, a, 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 town of descendants of escaped slaves mm -hmm. that was uh, an hour away from Cartagena in the, nor in the north of Colombia. And my summers would be, instead of going like many of the other children from of my classmates that would be going, you know, to spend the summer by the pool, I, I would be, you know, just following her in Palenque, also in, uh, in Barbacoas, which was a mining, a mining town, an Afro-Colombian mining town, on the on a river, on the Tecumbi, which was a river close to the Putumayo. So all of those, I think, I think the the contrast of spending my childhood vacations being witness to the hardship and the the 
not only the hardship, but other lives, how other people lived mm -hmm. this, and the richness of it. And then going back to, you know, to Bogota, to an urban environment where uh, just people lived in a different way and, we're, and in a society that was just trying, you know, society that fights uh, itself a great deal. So I think that all of that has, has just left a mark. Yeah. And so Vanessa asked, she said that she's interested in hearing more about the irony of having the flamenca comb on the indigenous masks. And she mentioned that um, it has a very deep ritual charge on the body that resembles almost an aura with the flowers. Yes. Yeah. So I think the mask, the mask it also wears as a, its femininity, but it also wears like a crown. So one is placed on top of the other. So I think between the mask and, and the comb, you have the push and pull of oppression and oppressor, all in, the, in that, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. We had another question asking about the Tyvek background that you use. Does it come black or is it painted? It comes black, but I paint it. Okay. All right. I think you can really see that in person. Like the there's a real richness and depth to the black. It, you know, it's it it sort of shows that it's not just one layer. Like there there is a real richness to it. That's beautiful. And I fold it. I don't know if you can see that, but I I fold it to resemble a quilt. And in that quilt, I think of the Midwest, of the prairie, of the U.S., of that other form of migration and that yeah. other form of feminine expression. Yeah. Um, Christian would like to know what school you went to in Bogota. I went to Universidad de los Andes. <laughs> <laughs> That was actually originally in your introduction and I was worried I couldn't pronounce that. So I apologize, Christian. I could have answered that for you. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have another question asking about the paint texture. Is it applied to mimic a texture um, or does it just depend on the original source of the image? Well, um... I think in some cases it resembles the historical object, the historical decorative object, but because I'm gluing them together, it kind of, they, it starts going into the world of painting and of contemporary painting and of all of the conversations that are, that one has when, when you know, when speaking of contemporary or the history of contemporary painting or modern painting, you know, the push and pull of color, background, foreground. So I think in the end, it goes, there, there's, there is a moving forward to the present, how it, how it sits today. Thank you. Well, if, you, if we have any more questions, I, I don't think I've missed any. Um, but if you have any more questions, please share them with us. We've got a couple minutes. Um, I'd love um, if maybe some students from Hannah's class wanted to ask Nancy a question. I love that you brought up quilts, Nancy, because um, so oftentimes they also have floral motifs, right? And it's really interesting to think about um, in terms of ethnography, which you brought up, um, sort of watching the patterns as they travel and then how they sort of evolve in different communities. So I think that's also really relevant to your work. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, so we just had another question from one of the students, um, from one of our CSU students. How do you stay motivated in difficult times? Hmm. <laughs> Not <laughs> pertinent to you today at all. <laughs> That's a great question. Okay, well, in extraordinary times like now, like, uh, it's, okay, it's been, I think the last month, I think, has been very difficult for everybody. I, I imagine everybody here. I, um, if this was not, I, mean, I don't think the last month I have been incredibly motivated. I have been going on with, with working, but I wouldn't say like doing creative breakthroughs. No, uh, I think it's been, I think it's hard. You just, you know, you're just hoping every, everything gets better and, and, and this thing is contained and we can go back to a sense of normalcy and but on normal normal regular times I would say by moving from one thing to the next so like when somebody asked me about sculpture it's like okay do something else try a different material carve some wood do a, do a, do a, learn, learn a new technique, learn woodcut. How is it if instead of, because like the working with inks, making, making these collages, it's a very swishy process. Mm -hmm. It's very, you know, the, it's kind of, it's sensual. The ink goes, it, it's very kind of, it's even a little bit emotional and expressionistic, but it's soft. It's not, and doing the project for this book, Oh boy, that was a left turn. It's like you, you take this thing, okay, make sure you don't cut yourself, uh, put some guides so the wood doesn't fly out and your tool doesn't fly out. So I think so, very often doing a left turn or stopping and reading, writing, writing or doing an application, writing for a grant. So which means revising, reading what is it that you're doing because it's not only the manual process it, there's always a there's always the intellectual work that goes behind that pushes the work it's like one pushes the next you know yeah. you break through formally and then at some point it kind of stalls and then you have to go back to okay what is this about yeah if that doesn't work okay then something else but I would say movement action. So I see we're, we're close to our hour, but Nancy, could we keep going? I think we have a few more questions. I'd love to be able to sort of um, have you respond if possible. Yes. Um, so we had a question <laughs> saying that actually the question about school in Bogota was asking about K through 12, not university. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, that's a very revealing question because <laughs> <laughs> it relates to uh, it relates to my summer vacations. My elementary school was in a bilingual Swiss school where I it was a a school that was very preppy and I learned to speak French and math in French and all of this and then the the contrast was those those summers the summers in and i and i think that left a huge impression and my high school was in a public school it my parents went the other way they said okay this didn't work out uh let's try the public school so i went to a, a, a school called the first one was elvesia and the second one was uh Instituto Pedagogico Nacional, and that, that's where I graduated. So I had those two, those two experiences. Yeah, but that's, that's a great question. Because I think it's in your origins where so much, so much uh, is germinated, is conceived. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to the idea of the Midwest and the full, the quilt folds in the Tyvek. Is the Midwest represented in any other ways in your work? And that 
this uh, this person recalls that the Midwest and its theme of dislocation was in some of your pieces at the Lux. Yeah, I would say that my root is Colombia. Definitely. Uh, I don't think I would be able to think of Colombia in the way that I think about and think of migration and displacement and transculturality and if I had not moved. And I have done a couple of pieces that represent a little bit uh, Nebraska. Uh, I did a, I, I have a piece called Anonymous, which is, uh, which is a, a found object placed on a, on a kind of minimal, minimalist pedestal. But I would say that my, aside from the quilt, really my root, my root is Colombia. I mean, that's what, you know, that's the little thing. That's, that's the little monkey on my shoulder that is always just kind of, you know, pulling at my ears and just, mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing that, yeah. Um, we also have a question from another CSU student asking, do you find yourself working on multiple pieces at the same time or just focusing on one? Uh, multiple pieces, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then I think this is a great question for us to wrap up on. Um, where do you go from here in your work? <laughs> well, I have a question. Visioning a sculpture, and it's not happening yet. I just finished the book. This was sort of my last, my last uh, project, and and I'm trying to get back into you know the swishiness of the ink, and it seems right now very foreign, and I don't know. The, I think the pandemic is uh, very unsettling. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you so much for your time, Nancy. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Jonathan. This is great. And thank you, everybody. I can't see anybody's face. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, I wanted to also say thank you to Jared Stephenson at Utah Museum of Contemporary Art who put Nancy's project together and was very generous in letting Columbus Museum be the second venue. We hope you all will be able to experience the show. Um, we'll announce dates once the museum reopens, so stay tuned and we'll certainly be making announcements about that. Yes, and thank you so much to everyone for joining us today and please check out our website to find more artist talks, resources, all types of good things. You can see our collection online. Um, and we hope to see you at the museum soon, but online even sooner. So have a great evening. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. Thank you.